Good morning, and welcome to Beverly Unitarian Church. I'm the Reverend David Schwartz, minister here at Beverly Unitarian, and it is a pleasure to welcome you into the service this morning. We welcome all people here, every color of the rainbow from every place on earth. And whatever your past was like, whatever this present moment is like for you, we invite you to journey into the future with us. That's not just an invitation for newcomers either. That's an invitation to all of us to recommit and reconnect every Sunday. Here we celebrate a diversity of beliefs, striving always to make space for more. Like other Unitarian Universalist congregations, we affirm seven principles, not a doctrine or a dogma, but a set of shared values, a moral guide that each of us individually and together has to struggle with and wrestle with and figure out how to live that out. To learn more about the principles, visit the website of our denomination, uua.org. We welcome visitors. Stay after the service this morning, if you like, for the virtual coffee hour on Zoom. The link's going to come at the very end of the service, or you may have received it in your weekly email. To learn more about the congregation, visit beverlyunitarian.org. Follow us on Facebook. Send an email to beverlyunitarian at gmail.com to sign up for that weekly email. Stay up to date with everything that's going on. We look forward to the day when we'll be able to meet you in person. And I am delighted to share that that day is coming soon. On Sunday, July 4th, we'll gather in person outside more information and details to come in the weeks ahead, but I hope if you're in town that weekend, you can join together and see each other again. That will also be my last service with you as your minister before moving on later in July out west to serve our congregation in Boulder, Colorado. Let us join together now. Let's take a deep breath together. prepare heart and mind for worship. We've just passed Memorial Day, the day that has become a joyous welcome to summer, and a welcome we may well be feeling more deeply this year than most. Increasing vaccination numbers, falling infection rates, and increased opportunities for everyone to socialize safely outdoors make it a time when celebration seems right and good. But Memorial Day is also a time to remember. We remember those lost in war and peace in service to others. We remember their individual sacrifice as well as the sacrifice of their loved ones. We note their loss in our own deeply interconnected and complex webs of love and care. We lay our wreaths on gravesides and bring cut flowers to those who mourn we mark the lives cut short and all of the impacts that loss brings. And then we turn and step and turn and step because our days continue on. In marking flower communion, we are invited not to swallow our mourning or to banish it, but to seek out the beauty of the life that still lives around us. We are invited to choose to inhabit this new moment and to choose a life of beauty and care from all that we see, to seek out fresh meaning in the contributions, the lives, the experiences that we share, and those that mark us, but that we don't describe. We are invited to choose a life that nurtures and appreciates and always remembers that we live best in each other's gardens, in each other's homes, and in each other's hearts. I encourage you today and in the days to come to look for the blooms that call you to beauty, to a life of care and hope. In this time together today, I encourage you to remember that all that you nurture, all that you nurture blooms somewhere for someone in ways you can scarcely imagine. Here in the deep and nourishing soil of communion, let yourself be filled and fed. 
that all might benefit from your work as gardener and your flourishing as blossom. Is the same sound as the blood in your body as it moves across your bones? Are you listening? Are you listening? Put your roots down, put your feet on the ground. Put your roots down, put your feet on the ground. You can hear the earth sing if you listen. You can hear the earth sing if you listen. Put your roots down, put your feet on the ground. You can hear the earth sing if you listen. Put your roots down, put your feet on the ground. You can hear the earth sing if you listen. Cause the sound of the river as it moves across the stones. Cause the sound of the river as it moves across the stones. Is the same sound as the blood in your body as it moves across your bones. Is, is the same sound as the blood in your body as it moves across your bones. Cause the sound of the river. Cause the sound of the river as it moves across the stones. As it moves across the stones Is the same sound as the blood in your body As it moves across your bones Is the same sound as the blood in your body As it moves across your bones Are you listening? Are you listening? Put your down, put your feet on the ground. You can hear the earth sing if you listen. Put your roots down, put your feet on the ground. You can hear the earth sing if you listen. Put your roots down, put your feet on the ground. You can hear the earth sing if you listen. Cause the sound of the river as it moves across the stone is the same sound as the blood in your body as it moves across your bones. Are you listening? Are you listening? May the light we now kindle inspire us to use our powers to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to bless and not to curse, to serve you, spirit of freedom. Friends, will you join me in the words of our covenant? Love is the spirit of this church and service its law. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. Nearly 100 years ago, the Unitarian minister Norbert Chopek offered his Czechoslovakian congregation a ritual to respond to their questions about how to be a community that welcomed rather than suppressed diversity. Czechoslovakia was a country formed in the aftermath of war. Struggling just five years after the end of that war with questions of belonging and identity, trust and anxiety. 
Topak's ritual took the traditional bread and wine communion that his community was too heretical for and too resistant to these usual symbols and played with this ritual. He turned instead to the beauty of nature all around them and invited each of his congregants to find a flower and bring it to the church one Sunday. That each person would find the flower that was beautiful to them was a symbol of their affirmation that each of us has a piece of the truth, our unique sense of what beauty means. On their way into the church, his congregation was in turn invited, each of them, to place that flower in a vase, which symbolized their free choice to enter into community alongside all the other people that saw beauty in their own way, symbolized by their flowers placed there as well. A free church where people freely choose to walk together across their differences. Once everyone had gathered, they'd bring the vase forward. Then the minister, Chopak, he would bless it. And then he'd invite everyone to choose a flower to take home with them, but just not the one that they came with. Again, this free choice affirmed each person's choice to be blessed by another and to receive with an open heart their different understandings of beauty and to feel connected rather than divided by this difference. In this moment where so many forces seek to divide people, to play on our fears of differences and our anxieties of the other, here we remember that we freely choose to walk together and to be blessed by the differences between us and to see these differences as beauty. Friends, please join me in an attitude of prayer and meditation. A Bouquet of People by Claire Feingold Thorin. Let us give thanks for a bouquet of people. We give thanks for children like tulips and iris. They multiply around us, making the world ever more filled with color, beauty, and new life. May we bless them as they replant themselves ever further from us knowing that they need their own space to grow into. We give thanks for generous friends as constant in bloom as echinacea and whose gifts lift up our body and spirit. We give thanks for feisty friends as indomitable as geraniums and for continuous friends who like bittersweet and ivy hold on and never let go and can never be gotten rid of for crotchety friends, as prickly as rose bushes, their beauty a secret that is only discovered through careful gardening. For surprising friends, who at first glance seem dour and then blossom into joy as quickly as forsythia. For funny friends, silly as snapdragons, and serious friends, complex as chrysanthemums. For comfortable friends, their gentle presence as soothing as the sweet smell of lilacs. For stormy weather friends who stand by us in hard times like lily of the valley that cannot be deterred by shade or shadow. For old friends nodding like sunflowers in the evening time and young friends coming on fast as flocks. For friends as unpretentious as dogwood, as persistent as pachysandra, as steadfast as azalea and who like snowdrops, can be counted on to see you through the winter and remind you that spring always comes. 
for loving friends who wind around us like wisteria and embrace us despite our blights, wilts, and witherings. And finally, for forget-me-not friends, gone but never forgotten, their beauty lives on in our memories and hearts. For this bouquet of people who brighten our lives each in their own way, we give thanks. Amen. Friends, we join here together, even virtually, as a sign of our commitment to one another, a signal of our understanding of the fact that we are more together than we are apart, that our variety and our individuality make us something new when we join together. Our commitment to one another both expresses and creates a web of mutuality on which we can all rely. Our shared experiences are part of that web, and the rest is made by the trust and vulnerability of sharing the parts of ourselves and our lives that are not experienced in common. We can be real, live persons here, our full selves with real struggles and exuberant joy. We can share our pride. We can share our failures. We can share our worries and our delights. These all strengthen our bonds and enrich the beauty that we weave together. Please share your joys and sorrows today in the chat, being mindful that it is a public forum. These words from the writer Octavia Butler. All that you touch, you change. All that you change, changes you. The only lasting truth is change. God is change. His mother, a devout Catholic and his father agnostic, Norbert became an acolyte at age 10 in 1890, St. Martin's Catholic Church. But in the years that followed, he became disillusioned. His priest was a cynic. And so at 18 in Vienna, apprenticed to his uncle, a successful tailor, Norbert discovered the Baptists and became a minister. He founded almost a dozen churches from Ukraine to Budapest. All that you touch, you change. 
but slowly his faith became more and more liberal. He left Bohemia under government threat. He accepted a call to serve a Baptist church in New York City. All that you change changes you. That was until one day in 1919. And that day he wrote in his diary, I cannot be a Baptist anymore, even in compromise. The fire of new desires, new worlds is burning inside me. Some of you know that experience if you've come here from other traditions. I cannot be a Baptist anymore, even in compromise. The only lasting truth is change. Norbert and his wife, Maya Chapek, joined a Unitarian church in New Jersey in 1921. For these same reasons some of you did, their children liked the religious education program. <laughs> Never underestimate good religious education. World War I ended and his home country now independent, he and Maya returned to Czechoslovakia. His church, his Unitarian church, was the Prague Liberal Religious Fellowship. And in just 20 years, it grew to 3,200 members. The traditional Christian communion service of bread and wine wouldn't meet the needs of his congregation because his church, like ours, deliberately, intentionally, on purpose, explicitly, had people who believed different things. So Chapek turned to the beauty of the countryside, the beauty of flowers, and in 1923 developed the flower ceremony. He asked his congregants to bring a flower to church from their gardens, the field, the roadside, and to put it in a vase. And right there was the church community, no less unique for being united. And then, following the service, each person could take a flower from the vase, a different one than what they had brought. The only lasting truth is change. God is change. Chapek's church in Prague in the 20s and 30s was a church that was willing to take risks and make tough decisions and bear disappointment and be bold and then to be even bolder. And friends, that is our church too. That was Chapek's church called to practice the same three prophetic tasks of every liberal church. Prophetic, not in telling fortunes or the future. Prophetic in telling the truth about right now. These are the three prophetic tasks of our church, too. Realism. Realism in the face of ideology. When people are so locked in ideology, instead to face reality. Grief. Grief when the world is in denial when the world is avoiding the pain, the suffering, the reality of what's going on right now, grief, naming it, embodying it, being honest about it, when the world is in denial, and hope, hope, when the world is in despair, a church that remembers despair is never the final word. Never. Chapek knew this. Chapek knew this, and for this, the Gestapo arrested him in 1942. The Nazis accused Chapek of listening to foreign broadcast. They accused him of high treason, and they used his sermons as evidence of the crime and sent him to Dachau, the concentration camp, the death camp. Even in starvation and torture, he held a flower ceremony with his fellow prisoners, finding whatever they could from among the weeds of the camp. And they testified. They testified then to a beauty larger than themselves and a love that would outlive them and to a shared commitment to a life that would see them through even to the end in that place. 
The Nazis killed Norbert Czapek, but his spirit and his courage and his commitment lives on today. It's passed to us now, handed across the century to make it real, to embody it. Ours is now the responsibility to stand fast in the liberty and the liberation and the community for which he died, the community of humanity. Ours is the responsibility to carry that forward just exactly as we are. In the last 20 years, from time to time, you have had ministers and members, I don't fault them, who have told you this church will be great again when we double in size. You've had ministers and members, I understand them, who said this church will be great when we finally move somewhere else. You've had ministers and members, and I get it, who told you this church will be great when we have a permanent minister, a called minister, a full-time minister, a long-term minister. I don't, I don't fault that. I don't resent those things, but I don't agree with any of them because I have watched you flourish in these last four years in spite of all the difficulties that have come with it. I've watched you flourish by being the best of who you are right now instead of waiting to become some other church. You don't need to be great again. You're great right now. You've said consciously or unconsciously, let us at last be us. Let us be the people and the community who we are and grow into the people and community that we're called to be. You, each of you, have come into this house, and I'll say that even though we're still virtual right now, you've come into this house to make a life at an intersection, at an intersection of personal growth, interior journey, and service to the world. You've come to make a life at an intersection in Chicago, at 103rd and Longwood, a place deeply concerned and invested in the neighborhood around it, not abstracted and removed from this place. You've come here, you've come here to make a life at the intersection of individual and community. Ritual, at its best, at its most honest, at its most hopeful, reminds us what matters. This annual flower service, remembering and retelling Chapek's story, isn't just a historical reenactment of something that's over and done with. It is an affirmation of our community's continuities with generations of struggle for ever-widening liberty. It is a reminder of what's essential what's unchanging, even as everything else changes. Because, friends, living out those commitments, living into the best of who we are and can be, requires being part of a community of change. And we as a church are in a season of change. This summer, my ministry with you will come to an end. And hopefully, not long after, a new minister will come. But that's not the only change, or it's no, certainly not the biggest change that's happening this summer, too, because we start on a path to reopening as a congregation and a city and a world soon. On Sunday, July 4th, we'll have our first in-person summer service outside. The first time to gather in person in a very long time. And that will be my last service with you. The change we're in isn't all about me. The world's going to reopen in a different way than it used to be. We've been talking about this these last weeks. 
people move through change in a cycle, in stages, in progression. And the first stage of change, the usual stage, the typical stage, the natural response, the emotional response is loss. That's the first step in the change cycle, loss. The realization that the way things have been is not the way that things will continue on. It's loss of safety, loss of comfort, loss of knowing what the expectations will be. You know, when you get a new boss or hear that you're going to get one, think of how that feels. When you know you're moving, when your kid is going from middle school to high school. One author suggests that in this first stage of change, it's like driving down a narrow road with no shoulder and a heavy fog sets in. And you have to slow down, but you also have to keep going because there are cars behind you. You can't just stop. Traffic's coming. You don't know what's ahead. You don't exactly know what's coming behind either, but you have to keep going, pushing on into it. And here's the thing, it is okay to be uncertain in that moment. Nothing's gone wrong if you feel that sense of loss or uncertainty. And things seem to get worse because they get better. Usually in change, the next thing that happens is doubt. Is this change the right thing to be doing? This second step of change... This is where words get sharper and louder. This is where temper comes out in doubt. And then it still doesn't really get any better because usually after doubt comes discomfort. Discomfort. Where the challenge is to break through instead of breaking down. Loss. Doubt discomfort. Maybe that's a linear progression. Maybe that's a tangled ball of yarn flipping back and forth between them. Maybe it's a cycle that you keep going through as you come back again. Loss, doubt, discomfort. This is a model taken from Anne Salerno and Lily Brock, change consultants and authors. Loss, doubt, discomfort, and then, and then, beginning glimmers of discovery. Starting to ask, how do I know what the best next step to take is? Discovery, where you gain perspective, where you look at the change from more sides than just your own. Discovery. And then understanding when you grasp the meaning of the change, what it really means for you. I think of all of these things for the congregation, yes, but also for the world outside us. What is the real meaning? What will it really mean to us to live in a post-pandemic world? discovery, and understanding, and then integration, which means making the change a part of your life. Each person moves through this cycle at their own pace, and different people find challenges in different parts of it, and each of us moves through it at our own speed, carrying our own baggage. In the midst of this change, Ritual, whether it's the flower ceremony or singing together or at last offering a handshake and a word of hello when we can get back in person again. Ritual like that as a community re-anchors us in what matters. It reminds us of those principles that don't change even as the context through which you move might change so dramatically. Chapek wrote, it is worthwhile to live and fight courageously for sacred ideals. Norbert Chapek wrote, it is worthwhile. 
It is worthwhile to live and fight courageously for sacred ideals. He says, Oh, blow ye evil winds into my body's fire, my soul you'll never unravel. Even though disappointed a thousand times, or fallen in the fight and everything would worthless seem, he says, I have lived amidst eternity. Not somewhere else, but here and now, I have lived amidst eternity. Be grateful, my soul. My life was worth living. To remember this flower ceremony each year isn't a diversion from an ugly reality or a denial of the constant change, but a gentle fierceness that proclaims in the midst of dark days and uncertain road ahead, there's always the light of beauty, of community, of unity in diversity. And even virtually, even without a flower in your hand, this Flower Sunday isn't a remembrance of something that happened, but something that is happening. It's a remembering, a putting back together again. And in that remembering, in that retelling of the story, may we put ourselves back together again too. Each as a part of the body of this community, out of many, one. May it be so. And amen. So like a ship lost out to sea Sliding far away, far away from me So like a ship that's run aground Grinding over sand Lost but also found Please bring me back Hey, hey.
Be ours a religion, which like sunshine goes everywhere. Its temple all space, its shrine the good heart, its creed all truth, its ritual works of love, its profession of faith, divine living.